Welcome to Science Goes to the Movies, a look at the stories of science and how they change our culture. I'm Lisa Beth Povitz. We're calling this episode Mistakes of the Jedi, Revenge of the Shrinks. Our guest today is Dr. Robin Rosenberg, the clinical psychologist who wrote your textbook, Abnormal Psychology. She's also the Uber editor of the Oxford University Press superhero series. Robin, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me back. Shmi Skywalker and her son Anakin live in terrible poverty on Tatooine, slaves to the drunk dealer Watto. Meeting a Jedi changes all that, but did the Jedi do right by the Skywalker family? Let's start with the first thing, removing a child from a home. Robin, they had room on that ship for Anakin's mother. Is it a great challenge for a child or is it terrible trauma for a child to be removed from his home? Great question. and. It depends. Depends on the attachment. It depends on the leaving. I mean, if there's any attachment, leaving will be hard, right? It will be traumatic. It's a loss. In the long term, is it a good thing or a bad thing? Again, it depends. It depends on what you were leaving. It depends on what you're going to. Um, throughout history, children have been transplanted from their home and sent to live with other people. It might have been extended family, it might have been boarding school, it might have been emigrating to strangers. So it has happened. People typically, if you want to say recover and um, do well in life, but you know why his mother didn't go. Qui-Gon Jinn removed Anakin from his terrible situation for his own ends. He did not have that boy's best interest in heart when he yes. pulled him out. And, and that could be an underlying reason why it doesn't really go well for the Skywalker family. We know from human non-Star Wars psychology <laughs> that humans are incredibly resilient. You can wonder about the added element if you have the force within you, what that boosts, if you will, in terms of resilience. And makes other things difficult. It's never easy to be a gifted child. Correct. Correct. It is typically easier when you're among other gifted children. While Anakin Skywalker is training, the Jedi Council tells the boy he's a coward for missing his mother. When he has legitimate fears for her safety, then mourns her very violent death. The Jedi call these feelings the basis for Anakin's dark side. But really, Robin, who doesn't have a dark side? I don't know anyone who doesn't have a dark side. I mean, a, a dark side which depends on how you define it, right? But we all have what we might call negative emotions. We can't live in a world, even in a Star Wars world, without negative emotions. In fact, negative emotions are our friends, right? Because they tell us if we're anxious about something, they're potentially signaling something really helpful that we should pay attention to. The issue, I think, in the Star Wars world around the dark side is that Jedi have power, right? So we gifted and so it's when you have those feelings how you behave in response to them right so having feelings is fine it's what you do with them and when you have uh, superpowers if you will and you act on those negative feelings that is really mm -hmm. the pull to I think the dark side that they're talking about it's at, it's the power and ability to act out of attachment. You don't have loss without attachment. And, and that can lead to all kinds of negative feelings, like revenge. Mm. And again, all of us may say, you know, oh, I'm so vengeful. But if we have the power to act on it and hurt people, that's a different story. You know, in preparing for this, I read a lot of essays musing on the idea that, that Anakin Skywalker had a variety of forms of attachment disorders. So what is an attachment disorder? So for us, attachment disorders start early. Infants, children, toddlers are not, they never form an attachment. Mm. And so they may be, as infants, they may not feed well. They may be uh, very what we would call anxious in an adult, right? And not soothe easily. They're not soothed by people, right? Um, or the other extreme is that they seem 
kind of attached to everyone, that kids don't have stranger anxiety, and they can really be harmed because mm. they have no sense of what, who not to approach. They don't have a negative feeling. They, they don't, don't have that. They don't have a sense that people are, are dangerous in the way that normal toddlers do. And then as people get older and enter adulthood, those can be problematic in terms of intimate relationships. So do children come into the world with those disorders? So in our world, they are typically environmental. They are, uh, they were very common, or I guess they still are, if you have infants who are, grow up in an institution where they, you know, it's, they're basically just fed mm. and they're not really cared for. Their physical needs are cared for, but not their emotional needs. Uh, we were seeing that in the former Soviet Union adoptees oh. because mm. that's how they were raised. When you have significant neglect or abuse um, in the home, whoever the primary caretaker is, you might see uh, attachment disorders. Yeah, Anakin doesn't seem to have those. He seems to have a normal attachment to his mother and a horrifying experience. Right, right. He, he was never really a successful Jedi yeah. in the way of being released from attachment. The glow of the lightsaber is amazing, and the thrill of being singled out as Force-sensitive sounds exciting. But the Jedi Order is also conscripting child soldiers, and while it might seem exciting to be raised by Yoda, that dude is not cuddly. How much human warmth do we need as children to become functional adults? It depends on what, what you mean by function. If you mean uh, sort of relationally function, we, we actually do need loving care, right, and warmth. There are the classic studies, Harry Harlow's monkey studies, mm -hmm. where they had baby monkeys who were either fed with a mock monkey with a bottle, but it was, it was not warm. It was just a, you know, like fencing material. And then they had monkeys who were with a cloth, like a terry cloth, but no, no feeding. And the monkeys preferred to kind of hang on to the terry cloth fake monkeys, even without the food, because it, it resembled something that they primordially yeah. Uh, wanted and so that's how we are. We really want warmth and um, emotional attachment. Now that said, there are individual differences. People who are autistic may not want, uh, you know, the act of hugging, of eye contact has a different meaning for them, and it can be painful actually. Mm -hmm. But if we put that aside, we all rest of us have a, a similar desire for a sort of tactile experience, warmth, caring, and didn't mirroring. It, didn't the monkeys in the, with, with zero warmth, zero, nothing to, didn't they go a little, a little monkey crazy? They, yeah, particularly the ones that only had the cage. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, we're not, most of us are not wired to live without attachment. The Jedi Council argue about rejecting Anakin in front of Anakin. They make it clear mm -hmm. to him that they think he's kind of evil, that he's a problem, and then they're horrified when he turns around and is a problem. So how do we talk about children or adults who are a problem without making it a self-fulfilling prophecy? It's uh, talking about the behaviors as a problem versus the person as a problem. So if you say, Anakin, you are a problem, right, then there's actually nothing he can do because it's, it's fundamental to who he is. Mm. Versus you say, Anakin, these are the behaviors that are a problem. How can we help you shift those behaviors if you want to stay in as a member of the force, right? Oh my God, they totally needed you. They needed a whole, they needed psychologists. On this, they they on this absolutely needed psychologists and they need coaching, right? I mean, that's the whole point is how to help him be motivated to lose his attachment, right? That, that was the, you know, versus don't be attached. And then it's, well, why, why shouldn't I be right. attached? Right. Um, so I, I think they, they did a very poor job of, yeah. of handling that.
After making mistakes with Anakin and Padme, the Jedi get a second chance with Anakin and Padme's children, and they decide not to tell Luke and Leia who their parents are, even as adults, which leads to one of the best cinematic third act reversal when Darth Vader gets to say, and please, in the studio or at home, please feel free to say it with me. No, I am your father. Robin, if you were one of the last remaining Jedi, and you know what you know as a psychologist, <laughs> would you tell Luke and Leia as adults who their blood relatives are? So it depends on what the goal is, right? It's not, it's not a clear-cut issue. Um, to the extent that that is a helpful thing for them to know, either lessons learned by their parents, mm. sure. I mean, I think that's a really, really good reason to tell someone, right? Is it to just give them the knowledge if there's no downside? Sure, why not? In the Jedi world, if there's a downside, right, because now we start, oh, there's a, maybe an attachment issue, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, maybe they get too angry and can't handle it. You know, who, then, then you sort of, well, why? I mean, in our world, it is more common now for an open adoption for people to know that they've been adopted. But at, with all kinds of genetic testing now, people are discovering that who they thought were their biological parents, but bo who, who their both mother and father were, or do donor or something, um, were not necessarily who their parents are, right? They find out the mom yeah. was having an affair, they yep. find out the dad had an affair, and, and in fact, their mom is not their bio mom. Yep. Um, so, and people are never told, and they, for generations, people have never been told, and they're discovering now without being told. Anecdotally, of the people I know who have experienced this, a lot of it, I think, was that they found out in such an unpleasant way, that, right. they, that they were not trusted with the information. Uh, and I think in the Star Wars saga, if, if the Jedi had trusted those into Luke and Leia with the information, then it would have been significantly less dramatic and that's not good. Right, <laughs> right, exactly. Now, if we look at Luke and Leia, right, Leia was clearly trustworthy, right? I mean, she, she, was, she was basically, you know, Go running girl. things. Yeah. So it would have been silly not to tell her on, on one level, although do you tell her she's a twin and she has a brother? Right, so that opens a whole can of worms because then you're still not trusting her enough to tell her something. And Luke, you know, when he was at the beginning of the first original chrono film, um, you know, he was really not mature. And he True. should not have been told, you know, in, until much, much further along in his training and he matured. He was really impulsive and not particularly thoughtful. So. Do the moral choices of our biological relatives have any effect on our psyches if, if we're not brought up with them, if it's a tangential to our experience? Does it, do those? So if, if we're, for lack of a better term, adopted, if we're not a, a biological fit, if you will, with our, our parents, um, it, it's always tricky not to fit in your family. Mm. And uh, it can be helpful to have a reason why you don't fit, yeah. right? And so that's the issue. You can even be living with your bio parents and for whatever reason, you're still not a great fit, and <laughs> which happens. And um, it's, it's a much harder on, on the whole family, yeah. actually, when that happens. My dad took me to see Star Wars in the summer of 1977, and I didn't think it was at all strange that Obi-Wan lies to Luke about Anakin Skywalker, waits for Luke to see Vader strike the final blow, consistently encourages Luke to hate and kill his own father. And of course, in the 1970s cut, Han Solo definitely shot first. But that's not acceptable for today's audiences. So the stories have been re-edited. Do we expect more from our superheroes these days? So American culture seems to have this tendency to put heroes on pedestals 
and and then like enjoy knocking them down. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, we we, we sort of it's a a black and white thing. We don't allow them to be human and have hu human in a way we don't like. <laughs> it's okay if they're human in a way we like. Um, to have foibles, to be imperfect. Every hero is written from the vantage point of the culture at the time, and so. All the star, each set of Star Wars movies are embedded in the culture and time in which they were filmed, um, as is true with any film uh, and any story. So I think that there are things that we would, you know, many of us would say, this would not be how it was filmed now. Many things across many spectrums and not just exactly. the superhero things. So some of many those films things. are a little strange to watch in right. light of what we know Correct. now. Correct. Yeah. And so I don't think Star Wars is really any different in right. that respect. Do you think we're taking superheroes more seriously? I'm going to be cynical again and chase the money, you know, ch follow the path of the money. I think that people um, want to see superhero films I, and that, or he heroic films. I mean, action films have been with us for a very long time and have been incredibly popular. Mm -hmm. If we, if we include The Godfather as an action hero film, it was one of the first to really cross the line and have, an, have a villain as a hero. With special effects now, it really is entering a different world uh, for anything that's, that's outside of the normal our world. So whether it's a, a superhero flying or it's live in another galaxy and what is life like, you know, science fiction is great for understanding our issues or once removed. Um, it's a great rehearsal. It's a great rehearsal of, of how issues play out mm -hmm. um, and possible consequences. So I, I think we're all really very curious um, and interested in that. I think it's also really cool to see a movie where people fly and have this power and that power and imagine what it's like. It's a great distraction. Yeah. A lot of comic book characters, heroes and villains alike, grow up orphans in horrifying situations because we, the readers and viewers, we like it that way. Why do we like it that way? I think there are a few reasons. One is it's better and more interesting storytelling, mm. right? The Batman's origin story, you know, with the traumatic arc is incredibly captivating versus, you know, Superman's landing yeah. from a rocket and being raised by these lovely people in Kansas, <laughs> right? Which, which is a more compelling story. Um, I think that it is hard to understand why someone would dedicate their life to being heroic. And uh, a trauma story makes sense of that, right? And it, it is true in our world. There's a huge literature on what's called post-traumatic growth, mm. which is people who have experienced a trauma make meaning of it by helping other people, mm. preventing it from happening, you know, help. Batman's case of apprehending. There, there are many, 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 many real life stories of people who've had real adversity and, and sort of come out the other side and really dedicate time and energy so to doing the, good. So the more extreme the, the origin point is, the more pleasure in the meaning making? I think the easier it is for the, the reader or viewer mm. to make sense of why do they continue to do this? I mean, you could do something you can do some do good acts occasionally. It doesn't make you a hero, right? A hero is an identity that's a sort of ongoing way of, of being in the world. It's that's a complicated thing these days, the whole issue of, of heroes, I think, for many, many reasons. It's, yeah. We're so imbued, our culture is now so imbued with this idea of hero. Uh, and the word gets thrown around the same way genius gets thrown around. Yeah. Uh, is there something you think that, that is different about a hero? In real life, people whose jobs are heroic, all kinds of first responders, typically they don't like when people refer to them as heroes or that it was heroic. Um, Interesting. You know, this is part of their identity is that they're doing good. Um, this is what my experience and what I've been told from, from people who are first responders. I, I think we want heroes. Mm -hmm. we, we both want to be inspired by heroes and we hope that someday someone will rescue us if we need rescuing. 
And so, you know, the, and, and, and all of us want to be heroes in our own journey. Even villains are literally heroes in their own journey. Well, let's talk about that because a lot of writers create a hero and his nemesis with a parallel traumatic background. One grows up to be good right. and the other evil. Harry Potter and Voldemort, Wolverine and his brother, Captain America and Bucky Barnes, Spider-Man and nearly all of his villains get stung or bit or consume or <laughs> fall into a big vat of something sciencey scary. But is there a magic pill or potion or something that makes one character become a hero and the other become villainous? So uh, in fiction, they have that mirror duality, if you will, just because writers in the 40s and 50s started doing it. Um, I, don't, I don't really think that it happens quite as, as neatly <laughs> in our world. Um, but I do think that there is, why do some people have significant adversity and dedicate their lives to helping others and other people dedicate their lives to helping themselves. Mm. And I don't actually think that we know enough to really answer that question. Um, is, is it how much is temperament? How much is environment? You know, how you were raised? Um, because even there you can have siblings who grew up in the same household and, you know, the, the old adage where one becomes a crook and the other a yeah. cop. Yeah. Um, and so I, I don't think we know enough about why some people are selfish, selfless and some people become selfish. But I'm glad that you made those that you made that that self selfish and selfless uh, a dividing point, because it seems from the hero villains of fiction that the. Uh, the person who, who devotes himself to, a, they, they're all devoted to a cause. They all want something, yes. and they all think they're doing good and right, but the hero is willing to sacrifice himself in the name of his cause, whereas the villains are often willing to sacrifice everything and anything else other than themselves in search of their cause. Which and, is true for Anakin when he's Darth Vader. Right. Right. I mean, that's right. a classic example. And, you know, there, there are um, people in the middle. So if we want to go to superheroes or supervillains, you can think of Poison Ivy as an example of someone who she really believes she's doing well. I mean, if we can look in our world, right, people on each side of the abortion issue mm -hmm. think they're doing, that they're acting heroically. They each think they're doing the right thing. In our world, it's not as black and white as it is in novels. And I think in comic books, even, it's not as black and white as it used to be. We're seeing yes. villains' points of views a lot, which, which you saw earlier in, uh, certainly in a lot of the anime, the, the villains, early villains, have great points of views, and you're not sure at first who's good, and you've got to kind of pick. Uh, and that just seems to be coming into the American psyche. Yeah, I, I actually think it's a marketing issue, honestly. <laughs> I mean, I think, you know, the original... <laughs> <laughs> books were, were often for children or soldiers, yeah. you know, and so it was having a very simple moral tale. And as these kids got older and still wanted to read and hear and see their their heroes, they wanted a more complex story. And so the market went where the market, where, where the target audience was. It's an excellent point. Sorry. I'm, no, no. Don't to be cynical. No, no, it's not. I think it's an excellent point. An excellent point. There was something just too sad about what became of Luke, Leah, and Han after that great Endor treehouse party. My childhood heroes went on to have really horrible lives, and I know they're fictional, but it was hard to keep watching Star Wars. In your opinion, why do superheroes matter to us so much? Well, I think when we, when there are friends from childhood, Oh. then, you know, they're our friends and we grow up and we want them to have happy lives and to do well. And uh, I think it's it's like an old friend. And for some of us, more so than others, yeah. the, the friendship is it's, it's actually technically called a parasocial relationship. There's a term for it. It can be incredibly meaningful. Yeah. Yeah, we knew them. We knew them, as, you know, especially because we had, I think, uh, in our generation, we had less. Uh, yes. Things to watch. We did. We did have less to watch. Yeah. You couldn't um, just go to the next thing. 
Yeah, and TV, for those right. of you watching, TV was just whatever was on the four channels you could get. <laughs> And if you didn't like what was on, you either went to play outside or you played in your room or you read. Oh my God. The Jedi are morally complicated. They leave Shmi Skywalker in slavery. They exile Ashoka Tano without a trial. And they ask Anakin to spy on a friend, essentially demanding that he be good, but also be evil when they need him to do rotten things. As an institution, the Jedi Order's moral inconsistencies are disturbing. And in real life right now, we're living with a lot of morally disturbing choices from our institution. Robin, are we all about to slide over to the dark side? Because it feels like we're all about to slide over to the dark side. So if we think about what the Jedi's mean by dark side, it's, it's not about the negative feelings. It's a, a sort of the abuse of power if you will, mm. the power of acting on those feelings. Um, and I think there are many people who would say that that is happening, um, unfortunately, and there, uh, that we, the people, the only power we have is in the ballot box. Mm. And we have to get people voting. Um, so I, I would say the danger is people with power. If they're not using their power selflessly versus selfishly, and so people need to vote. Unfortunately, we are out of time. Thank you so much for coming to chat with us. It's always a pleasure. Thanks for having me.